Oh, I just dragged it from there. Um, something I was quite happy with uh, there was um, uh, the, the actual texture that I used on this material. So I'm going to reuse this uh, diffuse material um, on this plinth as well. So we use the same kind of sandstone on the surface. Um, so I'm going to change this name here to um, uh, sandstone diffuse. There we go. And uh, I'm going to just drag it over here into this slot here and uh, keep it as an instance, so it's exactly the same. And now um, the same map is instanced into this window. And what I'm going to do here is, is uh, go to the uh, maps window. Actually, uh, let's just reorganize this because I've uh, inadvertently reorganized this uh, rollout. Uh, so we'll p grab maps and we'll put that um, underneath super sampling. And we'll get shader basic parameters and we'll put that back at the top. There we go. So the, the rollout's back in the normal order that we'd be in. Uh, go into maps and uh, drag this into here. Um, that was just another example of how you can actually um, customize Max's interface. You can change the order of rollouts to whichever order that you prefer. Um, so yeah, I've just dragged this in here and I'm going to say, yeah, make that an instance. So, you know, any changes I make to this version of the texture will get propagated to this version of the texture. So that, that's pretty cool. Um, but I'm going to create a unique uh, no uh, bump map for this. Um, using again noise. Uh, let's make the uh, difference again between these two values a little bit smaller. Let's make this a lot smaller here so we have much smaller noise. Um, I'm going to make it fractal and um, again I'm going to turn it into a mix. So let's choose a mix. Yes, I'll keep this current map. We'll copy that map. Uh, we'll have it blend. Blend those two together using the mix value. And, and I'll just change the size of the second map. So now we have some variation in our noise and you can see it looks reasonably stony there. Um, and uh, let's just do a quick test render of that to see what that looks like. Um, so there we go, we've got a nice sort of stone plinth now with uh, uh, a nice uh, texture on it there. Um, okay, um, let's make the teapot look a little bit more special. Now it's, you know, this is meant to be some kind of holy relic or something, so uh, let's make it look uh, quite shiny. Uh, we'll just put a new texture on, on here, um, and I'll call this um, Holy Teapot. Um, okay, and um, let's go down to Maps. Uh, I'm going to give it a reflection. Uh, I'm going to choose a bitmap. Um, in this case, I'm going to use this texture here, which is a HDRI image, which I've actually done of my own living room. Um, which is going to reflect into the teapot. So we're not going for a very realistic effect here, but just something interesting to uh, reflect on the surface of the teapot. Just accept those values. And uh, we're going to use it as an environment, a spherical environment. So it'll wrap around the, the teapot and it'll look quite interesting. Um, actually, let's go down here and increase the intensity of the uh, reflection a little bit more. Okay, there we go. Um, you can see here there's, there's the reflection that we're going to see in the teapot. Uh, so we'll just knock that down a little bit and uh, we'll make it a the teapot a little bit darker and a little more maybe bronzy looking. And uh, we'll give it a, quite a sharp highlight so it looks maybe metallic. There we go. So I'll just pop that on there and do a quick test render of that. And there you go. You can see it's got um, a, something a bit more of an interesting surface on it now. Um, maybe that reflection's not quite in the right place so um, I'll just rotate uh, the reflection a little bit here. Uh, let's try that. Uh, okay, and let's just put it around a little bit further. There we go. Try that. Okay. Um, quite like that now. So let's have a look what the fireball's like just as it's about to strike the teapot. Comes in and smacks it and uh, let's do a quick render of that there. You can see the teapot's looking pretty cool, nice and reflective, metallic looking, uh, with stones looking quite stony. Um, maybe, actually, maybe the stone's looking a little bit too large, the texture there. So let's just go into the bump and make those both a little bit smaller. Just knock that down and uh, do the same thing for the other uh, bump. Uh, there we go. And uh, maybe this is slightly higher status, so we'll go for a slightly better finish here on the stone. So there we go, we've got um, our plinth and we've got our fiery ball and we've got our teapot and it's been struck by the, the fiery ball and it's flying through the air.
one thing you'll notice here is you know this teapot really should probably be blurring at this point because it's been hit and it's flying through the air quite quickly so uh, let's go to there and look at the properties and we'll turn on um, image motion blur in this case which is a nice quick method for doing motion blur using a, a 2d motion blur method uh, we'll go to the render dialog and uh, we'll make sure that image motion blur is turned on um, and then just do a quick render test of that just to see how that comes out okay and there we go we can see uh, the teapot is motion blurred now um, we'll do the same thing for the fiery ball uh, turn on the properties of that there we go I'll uh, we'll go for image on that and we'll do the same thing for the rope um, now the rope actually isn't it, no actually it is rotating so it will actually uh, blur um, one of the problems with using modifiers to produce animation for instance is that if the object didn't transform ie the rope didn't actually move through space uh, Max would interpret that as not actually moving. It would just say, oh, it's deforming and uh, therefore it doesn't have any motion blur. That's that's one of the problems with image motion blur. It doesn't take into account deforming objects, deforming surfaces, which if this rope only had a bend um, animated on it, that's all it would be. It would just be a deforming of the surface instead of uh, the rope actually moving. Um, now, luckily in this case, I've actually rotated the rope, uh, so that actually should motion blur. So let's just do a quick test render of that and you, these uh, two objects should now motion blur. Okay, so there we go. We've got the fiery ball and it's motion blurring and we can see the teapots motion blurring. So um, we've got a quite nice uh, look to that there. Um, okay, so now that we've got quite a reasonable looking render, I think we should uh, move on to maybe working on the uh, particles. So um, bring a particle view again. Um, we'll uh, go back to frame zero. Let's turn on the particles. Um, now at the moment, uh, the particles don't actually have any real geometry. There's no real shape to them. Um, and it's only because of the display um, operator that you're seeing them as lines in the viewport. Um, so in this case, I'm going to use a shape facing um, operator, wh which will make rectangles that actually face towards um, a camera. Um, so we'll just put that here um, after force. Um, we need um, to add a uh, camera to that now. So we'll go here and we'll say uh, use this camera. We'll just limit this to cameras here. There we go, use this camera. And now all the, the facing uh, shapes will actually point towards the camera. Um, let's actually uh, get some particles going here. And I actually want to see these um, in the viewport now, so let's change the display from lines to geometry. And that will actually show the geometry of the particles themselves. So if we uh, let this play through, you can see you've got these little tiny rectangles. Um, they're actually pretty tiny, so uh, let's uh, get the particle view back up and uh, change the, the size of those. Um, I'll base them on screen space so they'll actually be based on the, the, the image size. Um, the proportion at the moment, you can see if I move this down, is, is 1%. Um, so we'll change that to uh, 2%, so a little bit larger. And we'll change the variation in the size of them to 50%, so there's quite a bit of a variation in the size of our flame particles. Um, so that, that, that should look a little bit more interesting. Um, now the next thing to do is actually to make a material for them so you can see I've run out of material slots here so I'm actually just going to drag this over here a little bit um, there are actually a lot more slots in here than just six um, there's a full 24 as far as I remember um, so we've got another six over here so we'll just make uh, use of those so we'll call this flame um, and uh, this is going to be um, a self-luminous material so we'll just turn this into 100% uh, self-luminous um, it's going to be an orangey kind of texture. There we go. And uh, we're going to use a map to control the opacity of it. So we'll go in here and we'll choose um, a gradient ramp. And we'll make it into um, a radial gradient ramp so it's now circular like this. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, white is opaque and black is transparent. So at the moment, our, our gradient is actually backwards. So we'll just change this to white. Uh, we'll just change this to black. We'll copy this flag just by dragging this like this. That's just to make sure that it, it's completely transparent at the edge. Um, I'll get rid of this flag because I, I don't really need it. And um, at the moment it's 100% opaque in the center and I really don't want that. So we'll go for 50% 50, 50 opaque. Um, so that's pretty cool. And um, the transparency method needs to be changed so that um, as the particles overlap each other, um, that this orangey color which I have here um, will, will add up and produce a nice sort of flame effect. Um, so I'll just go for change that color there. I'm going to extend.